Good evening, and welcome to Beyond the Copyright, a collection of public domain readings read by me, Mike Jesus Langer. Tonight, I'll be reading the final chapter of Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis with a compilation of all three chapters coming to this channel next Friday. If you want to help this video travel through the rusty pipes of the YouTube algorithm, make sure to like the video and comment Kafka so that we can catch the attention of the cybernetic spider god that rules this realm. With all that said, I hope you enjoy this reading of a strange, strange tale. The serious injury done to Gregor, which disabled him for more than a month, the apple went on sticking in his body as a visible reminder since no one ventured to remove it, seemed to have made even his father recollect that Gregor was a member of the family, despite his present unfortunate and repulsive shape and ought not to be treated as an enemy, that, on the contrary, family duty required the suppression of disgust. An exercise of patience. Nothing but patience. And although his injury had impaired, probably forever, his powers of movement, and for the time being it took him long, long minutes to creep across the room like an old invalid, there was no question now of crawling up the wall, Yet in his own opinion, he was sufficiently compensated for this worsening of his condition by the fact that towards evening, the living room door, which he used to watch intently for an hour or two beforehand, was always thrown open, so that lying in the darkness of his room, invisible to the family, he could see them all at the lamplit table and listen to their talk, by general consent as it were, very different from his earlier eavesdropping. True, their intercourse lacked the lively character of former times, which he had always called to mind with a certain wistfulness in the small hotel bedrooms where he had been wont to throw himself down, tired out on damp bedding. They were now mostly very silent. After supper, his father would fall asleep in his armchair. His mother and his sister would admonish one another to be silent. His mother, bending low over the lamp, stitched at fine sewing from an underwear firm. His sister, who had taken her job as a salesgirl, was learning shorthand and French in the evenings on the chance of bettering herself. Sometimes, his father woke up, and as if quite unaware that he had been sleeping, said to his mother, What a lot of suing you're doing today. And at once, fell asleep again, while the two women exchanged a tired smile. With a kind of mullishness, his father persisted in keeping his uniform on even in the house. His dressing gown hung uselessly on its peg, and he slept fully dressed where he sat, as if he were ready for service at any moment, and even here, only on the beck and call of a superior. As a result... His uniform, which was not brand new to start with, began to look dirty. Despite all the loving care of the mother and sister to keep it clean, and Gregor often spent whole evenings gazing at the many greasy spots in the garment, gleaming with gold buttons always in a high state of polish, in which the old man sat sleeping in extreme discomfort, and yet quite peacefully. As soon as the clock struck ten, his mother tried to rouse his father with gentle words and to persuade him to get into bed. For sitting there he could not have a proper sleep, and that was what he needed most, since he had to go on duty at six. But with the mullishness that had obsessed him since he became a bank messenger, he always insisted on staying longer at the table, although he regularly fell asleep again, and in the end only with the greatest trouble could get out of the armchair and into his bed. However insistently Gregor's mother and sister kept urging him with gentle reminders, he would go on slowly shaking his head for a quarter of an hour, keeping his eyes shut, and refused to get to his feet. The mother plucked at his sleeve, whispering endearments in his ear. The sister left her lessons to come to her mother's help, but Gregor's father was not to be caught. He would only sink down deeper into his chair. Not until the two women hoisted him up by the armpits did he open his eyes and look at them both, one after the other, usually with the remark, This is life. This is the peace and quiet of my old age and, leaning on the two of them, he would heave himself up with difficulty, as if he were a great burden to himself, suffer them to lead him as far as the door, and then wave them off and go on alone, while the mother abandoned her needlework and the sister her pen in order to run after him and help him further. Who could find time, in this overworked and tired out family, to bother about Gregor more than was absolutely needful? The household was reduced more and more. The servant girl was turned off, a gigantic bony charwoman with white hair flying around her head came in morning and evening to do the rough work. Everything else was done by Gregor's mother, as well as great piles of sewing. Even various family ornaments, which his mother and sister used to wear with pride at parties and celebrations, had to be sold. 
as Gregor discovered of an evening from hearing them all discuss the prices of pain. But what they lamented most was the fact that they could not leave the flat, which was now much too big for their present circumstances, because they could not think of a way to shift Gregor. Yet, Gregor saw well enough that consideration for him was not the main difficulty preventing the removal, for they could have easily shifted him in some suitable box with a few air holes in it. What really kept them from moving into another flat was rather their own complete hopelessness, and the belief that they had been singled out for a misfortune such as had never happened to any of their relations or acquaintances. They fulfilled, the uttermost, all that the world demands of poor people. The father fetched breakfast for a small clerk in the bank, the mother devoted her energy to making underwear for strangers, the sister trotted to and fro behind the counter at the behest of customers, but more than that, they had not the strength to do. And the wound in Gregor's back began to nag at him afresh when his mother and sister, after getting his father into bed, came back again, left their work lying, drew close to each other, and sat cheek by cheek when his mother, pointing towards the room, said, Shut that door now, Grete. And he was left again in the darkness. While next door, the woman mingled their tears, or perhaps sat dry-eyed staring at the table. Gregor hardly slept at all, by night or by day. He was often haunted by the idea that next time the door opened, he would take the family's affairs in hand again, just as he used to do. Once more, after this long interval, there appeared in his thoughts the figures of the chief and the chief clerk, the commercial travelers and apprentices, the porter who was so dull-witted, two or three friends in other firms, a chambermaid in one of the rural hotels, a sweet and fleeting memory, cashier in a milliner's shop, whom he had wooed earnestly but too slowly, they all appeared together with strangers or people he had quite forgotten. But instead of helping him and his family, they were one and all unapproachable and he was glad they had vanished. At other times, he would not be in the mood to bother about his family. He was only filled with rage at the way that they neglected him. And although he had no clear idea of what he might care to eat, he would make plans for getting into the larder and take the food that was after all his due, even if he was not hungry. His sister no longer took thought to bring him what might especially please him, but in the morning and at noon, before she went to business, hurriedly pushed into his room with her foot any food that was available, and in the evening cleared it out again with one sweep of the broom, heedless of whether it had been merely tasted or, as most frequently happened, left untouched. The cleaning of his room, which she now did always in the evenings, could not have been done more hastily. Streaks of dirt stretched along the walls. Here and there lay balls of dust and filth. At first, Gregor used to station himself in some particularly filthy corner when his sister arrived in order to reproach her with it, so to speak. But he could have sat there for weeks without getting her to make any improvement. She could see the dust as well as he did, but she had simply made up her mind to leave it alone. And yet, with a touchiness that was new to her, which seemed anyhow to have infected the whole family, she jealously guarded her claim to be the sole caretaker of Gregor's room. Her mother once again subjected his room to a thorough cleaning, which was achieved only by means of several buckets of water. All this dampness, of course, upset Gregor too, and he lay widespread, sulky and motionless on the sofa. But she was well punished for it. Hardly had his sister noticed the changed aspect of his room that evening that she rushed in high dudgeon into the living room, and despite the imploringly raised hands of her mother, burst into a storm of weeping while her parents, her father had of course startled out of his chair, Looked on at first in hopeless amazement, they too began to go into action. The father approached the mother on his front for not having left the cleaning of Gregor's room to his sister, shrieked at the sister on his left that never again was she allowed to clean Gregor's room, while the mother tried to pull his father into his bedroom since he was beyond himself with agitation. The sister, shaken with sobs, then beat upon the table with her small fist, and Gregor hissed loudly with rage because not one of them thought of shutting the door to spare him such a spectacle and so much noise. Still, even if the sister, exhausted by her daily work, had grown tired of looking after Gregor as she did formerly, there was no need for his mother's intervention or for Gregor's being neglected at all. The charwoman was there. This old widow, whose strong bony frame had enabled her to survive the worst the long life could offer, by no means recoiled from Gregor. Without being in the least curious, she had once by chance opened a door of his room, and at the sight of Gregor, who, taken by surprise, began to rush to and fro, although no one was chasing him, merely stood there with her arms folded. From that time, she never failed to open his door, a little, for a moment, 
morning and evening, to have a look at him. At first, she even used to call him to her with words which apparently she took to be friendly, such as, Come along then, you old dung beetle! Or, Look at the old dung beetle then! To such allocations, Gregor made no answer, but stayed motionless where he was, as if the door had never been opened. Instead of being allowed to disturb him so senselessly, whenever the whim took her, she could rather have been ordered to clean out his room daily, that charwoman. Once, early in the morning, heavy rain was lashing on the window panes, perhaps a sign that spring was on the way. Gregor was so exasperated when she began addressing him again that he ran at her as if to attack her, although slowly and feebly enough. But the charwoman, instead of showing fright, merely lifted high a chair that happened to be beside the door, and as she stood there with her mouth wide open, it was clear that she meant to shut it only when she brought the chair down on Gregor's back. So you're not coming any nearer, she asked, as Gregor turned away again and quietly put the chair back into the corner. Gregor was now eating hardly anything. Only when he happened to pass the food laid out in front of him did he take a bit of something in his mouth as a pastime, kept it there for an hour at a time, and usually spat it out again. At first he thought it was chagrin over the state of his room that prevented him from eating, yet he soon got used to the various changes in his room. It had become a habit of the family to push into his room things there was no room for elsewhere, and there were plenty of these now, since one of the rooms had been let to three lodgers. These serious young men, all three of them with full beards, as Gregor once observed through a crack in a door, had a passion for order, not only in their own room, but since they were now members of the household, in all arrangements, especially in the kitchen. Superfluous, not to say dirty, objects they could not bear. Besides, they had brought with them most of the furnishings they needed. For this reason, many things could be dispensed with that it was no use trying to sell, but that should not be thrown away either. All of them found their way into Gregor's room. The ash can likewise, and the kitchen garbage can. Anything that was not needed for the moment was simply flung into Gregor's room by the charwoman, who did everything in a hurry. Fortunately, Gregor usually saw only the object, whatever it was, and the hand that held it. Perhaps she intended to take the things away again as time and opportunity offered, or collect them until she could throw them all out in a heap. But in fact, they just lay wherever she happened to throw them, except when Gregor pushed his way through the junk heap and shifted it somewhat. At first out of necessity, because he had not room enough to travel, but later with increasing enjoyment. Although, after such excursions, being sad and weary to death, he would lie motionless for hours. And since the lodgers often ate their supper at home in the common living room, the living room doors stayed shut many an evening. Yet Gregor reconciled himself quite easily to the shutting of the door, for often enough, on evenings, when it was opened, he had disregarded it entirely and lain in the darkest corner of his room, quite unnoticed by the family. But on one occasion, the charwoman left the door open a little, and it stayed ajar even when the lodgers came in for supper and the lamp was lit. They set themselves at the top end of the table, where formerly Gregor and his father and mother had eaten their meals, unfolded their napkins, and took knife and fork in hand. At once his mother appeared in the other doorway, with a dish of meat, and close behind her, his sister with a dish of potatoes piled high. The food steamed with a thick vapor. The lodgers bent over the food set before them as if to scrutinize it before eating. In fact, the man in the middle, who seemed to pass for an authority with the other two, cut a piece of meat as it lay on the dish, obviously to discover if it were tender or should it be sent back to the kitchen. He showed satisfaction, and Gregor's mother and sister, who had been watching anxiously, breathed freely and began to smile. The family itself took its meals in the kitchen. Nonetheless, Gregor's father came into the living room before going into the kitchen, and with one prolonged bow, cap in hand, made a round of the table. The lodgers all stood up and murmured something in their beards. When they were alone again, they ate their food in almost complete silence. It seemed remarkable to Gregor that among the various noises coming from the table, he could always distinguish the sound of their masticating teeth, as if this was a sign to Gregor that one needed teeth in order to eat, and that with toothless jaws, even one of the finest make, one could do nothing. I am hungry enough, said Gregor sadly to himself. But not for that kind of food. How these lodgers are stuffing themselves, and here I am dying of starvation. On that very evening, during the whole of his time there, Gregor could not remember ever having heard a violin, the sound of a violin playing came from the kitchen. <laughs> 
The loungers had already finished their supper. The one in the middle had brought out a newspaper and given the other two a page apiece, and now they were leaning back at ease, reading and smoking. When the violin began to play, they pricked up their ears, got to their feet, and went on tiptoe to the hall door where they stood huddled together. Their movement must have been heard in the kitchen, for Gregor's father called out, Is the violin playing disturbing you, gentlemen? It can be stopped at once. On the contrary, said the middle lodger, could not Fräulein Samsa come and play in this room, beside us, where it is much more convenient and comfortable? Oh, certainly, cried Gregor's father, as if he were the violin player. The lodgers came back into the living room and waited. Presently, Gregor's father arrived with the music stand, his mother carrying the music, and his sister with the violin. His sister quietly made everything ready to start playing. His parents, who had never let rooms before, and so had an exaggerated idea of the courtesy due to lodgers, did not venture to sit down on their own chairs. His father leaned against the door, the right hand thrust between two buttons on his liberally coat, which was formally buttoned up. But his mother was offered a chair by one of the lodgers and, since she left the chair just where he had happened to put it, sat down in a corner to one side. Gregor's sister began to play. The father and mother, from either side, intently watched the movements of her hands. Gregor, attracted by the playing, ventured to move forward a little until his head was actually inside the living room. He felt hardly any surprise at his growing lack of consideration for others. There had been a time when he prided himself on being considerate. And yet, just on this occasion, he had more reason than ever to hide himself, since owing to the amount of dust which lay thick in his room and rose into the air at the slightest movement, he too was covered with dust, fluff and hair and remnants of food trailed with him, caught on his back and along his sides. His indifference to everything was much too great for him to turn his back and scrape himself clean on the carpet, as he had done several times a day. And in spite of his condition, no shame deterred him from advancing a little over the spotless floor of the living room. To be sure, no one was aware of him. The family was entirely absorbed in the violin playing. The lodgers, however, who first of all had stationed themselves, hands in pockets, much too close behind the music stand, so that they could all have read the music, which must have bothered his sister, had soon retreated to the window, half whispering with bent down heads, and stayed there while his father turned an anxious eye on them. Indeed, they were making it more than obvious that they had been disappointed in their expectations of hearing good or enjoyable violin playing, that they had more than enough of the performance and only out of courtesy suffered a continued disturbance of their peace. From the way they all kept blowing the smoke of their cigars high in the air through the nose and mouth, one could divine their irritation. And yet, Gregor's sister was playing so beautifully. Her face leaned sideways, intently and sadly her eyes followed the notes of the music. Gregor crawled a little further and lowered his head to the ground so that it might be possible for his eyes to meet hers. Was he an animal when music had such an effect upon him? He felt as if the way were opening before him to the unknown nourishment he craved. He was determined to push forward till he reached his sister, to pull at her skirt and let her know that she was to come into his room with her violin, for no one here appreciated her playing as much as he would appreciate it. He would never let her out of his room, at least not so long as he lived. His frightful appearance would become, for the first time, useful to him. He would watch all the doors of his room at once and spit at intruders. But his sister should need no constraint. She should stay with him of her own free will. She should sit beside him on the sofa, bend down her ear to him, and hear him confide that he had the firm intention of sending her to the conservatorium, and that, but for his mishap, last Christmas. Surely, Christmas was long past. He would have announced it to everybody without allowing a single objection. After this confession, his sister would be so touched that she would burst into tears, and Gregor would then raise himself to her shoulder and kiss her on the neck, which, now that she went to business, she kept free of any ribbon or collar. Mr. Samsa, cried the middle lodger to Gregor's father and pointed without wasting any more words at Gregor, now working himself slowly forwards. The violin fell silent. The middle lodger first smiled to his friends with a shake of the head and then looked at Gregor again. Instead of driving Gregor out, 
his father seemed to think it more needful to begin by soothing down the lodgers, although they were not at all agitated and apparently found Gregor more entertaining than the violin playing. He hurried towards them and, spreading out his arms, tried to urge them back into their own room and at the same time to block their view of Gregor. They now began to be really a little angry. One could not tell whether it was because of the old man's behavior or because it had just dawned on them all, unwittingly, they had such a neighbor as Gregor next door. They demanded explanations of his father. They waved their arms like him, tugged uneasily at their beards and only with reluctance back towards their room. Meanwhile, Gregor's sister, who stood there as if lost when her playing was so abruptly broken off, came to life again, pulled herself together all at once after standing for a while holding violin and bow in nervously hanging hands and staring at her music, pushed her violin into the lap of her mother, who was still sitting in her chair fighting asthmatically for breath, and ran into the lodger's room, to which they were now being shepherded by her father rather more quickly than before. One could see the pillows and blankets on the beds flying under her accustomed fingers and being laid in order. Before the lodgers had actually reached her room, she had finished making their beds and slipped out. The old man seemed once more to be so possessed by his mullish self-assertiveness that he was forgetting all the respects he should show to his lodgers. He kept driving them on and driving them on until in the very door of the bedroom, the middle lodger stomped his foot loudly on the floor and so brought him to a halt. I beg to announce, said the lodger, lifting one hand and looking also at Gregor's mother and sister, that because of the disgusting conditions prevailing in this household and family, here he spat on the floor with emphatic brevity, I give you notice on the spot. Naturally, I won't pay you a penny, not even for the days I have lived here. On the contrary, I shall consider bringing an action for damages against you, based on claims. Believe me, that will be easily susceptible of proof. He ceased and stared straight in front of him, as if expected something. In fact, his two friends at once rushed into the breach with these words, and we too give notice on the spot. On that, he seized the door handle and shut the door with a slam. Gregor's father, groping with his hands, staggered forward and fell into his chair. It looked as if he were stretching himself there for an ordinary evening nap, but the marked jerkings of his head was as if uncontrollable, showed that he was far from sleep. Gregor had simply stayed quietly all the time on the spot where the lodgers had espied him. Disappointment at the failure of his plan, perhaps also the weakness arising from extreme hunger, made it impossible for him to move. He feared, with a fair degree of certainty, that at any moment the general tension would discharge itself in a combined attack upon him, and he lay waiting. He did not react even to the noise made by the violin as it fell off his mother's lap from under her trembling fingers and gave out a resonant note. My dear parents, said his sister, slapping her hand on the table by a way of introduction, things can't go on like this. Perhaps you don't realize that, but I do. I won't utter my brother's name in the presence of this creature. And so, all I say is, we must try to get rid of it. We've tried to look after it and to put up with it as far as is humanely possible, and I don't think anyone could reproach us in the slightest. She is more than right, said Gregor's father to himself. His mother, who was still choking for lack of breath, began to cough hollowly into her hand with a wild look in her eyes. His sister rushed over to her and held her forehead. His father thought seemed to have lost their vagueness at Grede's words. He sat more upright, fingering his service cap that lay among the plates still lying on the table from the lodger's supper, and from time to time he looked at the still form of Gregor. We must try to get rid of it, his sister now said explicitly to her father, since her mother was coughing too much to hear a word. It will be the death of both of you, I can see that coming. When one has to work as hard as we do, all of us, one can't stand this continual torment at home on top of it. At least I can't stand it any longer. And she burst into such a passion of sobbing that her tears dropped on her mother's face where she wiped them off mechanically. My dear, said the old man sympathetically and with evident understanding, but what can we do? Gregor's sister merely shrugged her shoulders to indicate the feeling of helplessness that had now overmastered her during her weeping fit, in contrast to her former confidence. If... He could understand us? 
said her father, half questioningly. Grete, still sobbing, vehemently waved a hand to show how unthinkable that was. If he could understand us, repeated the old man, shutting his eyes to consider his daughter's conviction that understanding was impossible. Then perhaps we might come to some sort of an agreement with him, but as it is... He must go, cried Gregor's sister. There's only one solution, father. You must just try to get rid of the idea that this is Gregor. The fact that we've believed it for so long is the root of all our trouble. But how can it be Gregor? If this were Gregor, he would have realized long ago that human beings can't live with such a creature, and he would have gone away of his own accord. Then we wouldn't have any brother, but we'd be able to go on living and keep his memory in honor. As it is, this creature persecutes us, drives away our lodgers, obviously wants the whole apartment to himself, and would have us all sleep in the gutter. Just look, father. She shrieked all at once. He's at it again. And in an access of panic that was quite incomprehensible to Gregor, she quitted her father, literally thrusting the chair from her, as if she would rather sacrifice her mother than stay so near to Gregor, and rushed behind her father, who also rose up, being simply upset by her agitation, and half spread his arms out as if to protect her. Yet Gregor had not the slightest intention of frightening anyone, far less his sister. He had only begun to turn around in order to crawl back to his own room. But it was certainly a startling operation to watch, since because of his disabled condition, he could not execute the difficult turning movements, except by lifting his head and then bracing it against the floor over and over again. He paused and looked round. His good intentions seemed to have been recognized. The alarm had only been momentary. Now they were all watching him in melancholy silence. His mother lay in her chair, her legs stiffly outstretched and pressed together, her eyes almost closing for sheer weariness. His father and his sister were sitting beside each other, his sister's arm around the old man's neck. Perhaps I can go on turning around, thought Gregor, and began his labors again. He could not stop himself from panting with effort, and had to pause now and then to take a breath. Nor did anyone harass him. He was left entirely to himself. When he had completed the turnaround, he began at once to crawl straight back. He was amazed at the distance separating him from his room, and could not understand how, in his weak state, he had managed to accomplish the same journey so recently, almost without remarking it. Intent on crawling as fast as possible, he barely noticed that not a single word, not an ejaculation from his family, interfered with his progress. Only when he was already in the doorway did he turn his head around, not completely, for his neck muscles were getting stiff but enough to see that nothing had changed behind him except that his sister had risen to her feet. His last glance fell on his mother, who was now quite overcome by sleep. Hardly was he inside of his room when the door was hastily pushed shut, bolted, and locked. The sudden noise in his rear startled him so much that his little legs gave way beneath him. It was his sister who had shown such haste. She had been standing ready waiting and had made a light spring forward, Gregor had not even heard her coming, and she cried, At last, to her parents, as she turned the key in the lock. And what now? said Gregor to himself, looking around in the darkness. Soon he made the discovery that he was now unable to stir a limb. This did not surprise him, rather it seemed unnatural that he should ever actually have been able to move on these feeble little legs. Otherwise, he felt relatively comfortable. True, his whole body was aching but it seemed that the pain was gradually growing less and would finally pass away. The rotting apple in his back and the inflamed path around it, all covered with soft dust, already hardly troubled him. He thought of his family with tenderness and love. The decision that he must disappear was one that he held to even more strongly than his sister, if that were possible. In this state of vacant and peaceful meditation, he remained until the tower clock struck three in the morning. The first broadening of light in the world outside the window entered his consciousness once more. Then, his head sank to the floor of its own accord, and from his nostrils came the last faint flicker of his breath. When the charwoman arrived early in the morning, what between her strength and her impatience she slammed all the doors so loudly, never mind how often she had been begged not to do so, that no one in the whole apartment could enjoy any quiet sleep after her arrival, she noticed nothing unusual as she took her customary peek into Gregor's room. She thought he was lying motionless on purpose, pretending to be in the cell. 
she credited him with every kind of intelligence. Since she happened to have the long-handled broom in her hand, she tried to tickle him up with it from the doorway. When that too produced no reaction, she felt provoked and poked at him a little harder. And only when she had pushed him along the floor without meeting any resistance was her attention aroused. It did not take her long to establish the truth of the matter, and her eyes widened. She let out a whistle, yet did not waste much time over it, but tore open the door of the Samsa's bedroom and yelled into the darkness at the top of her voice. Just look at this! It's dead! It's lying here, dead and done for! Mr. and Mrs. Samsa started up in a double bed, and before they realized the nature of the charwoman's announcement, had some difficulty in overcoming the shock of it. But then, they got out of bed quickly, one on either side, Mr. Samsa throwing a blanket over his shoulders, Miss Samsa in nothing but her nightgown. In this array, they entered Gregor's room. Meanwhile, the door of the living room opened too, where Grede had been sleeping since the advent of the lodgers. She was completely dressed as if she had not been to bed, which seemed to be confirmed also by the paleness of her face. Dead? said Miss Samsa, looking questioningly at the charwoman, although she could have investigated for herself, and the fact was so obvious enough without investigation. I would say so, said the charwoman, proving her words by pushing Gregor's corpse a long way to one side with a broomstick. Mrs. Samsa made a movement as if to stop her, but checked it. Well, said Mr. Samsa, now thanks be to God. He crossed himself, and the free woman followed his example. Grete, whose eyes never left the corpse, said, Just see how thin he was. It's such a long time since he's eaten anything. The food came out again just as it went in. Indeed, Gregor's body was completely flat and dry, as could only now be seen when it was no longer supported by the legs and nothing prevented one from looking closely at it. Come in beside us, Grete, for a little while, said Miss Samsa, with a tremulous smile, and Grete, not without looking back at a corpse, followed her parents into her bedroom. The charwoman shut the door and opened the window wide. Although it was so early in the morning, a certain softness was perceptible in the fresh air. After all, it was already the end of March. The three lodgers emerged from their room and were surprised to see no breakfast. They had been forgotten. Where's our breakfast? said the middle lodger peevishly to the charwoman, but she put her finger on her lips and hastily, without a word, indicated by gestures that they should go into Gregor's room. They did so, and stood, their hands in their pockets of their somewhat shabby coats, around Gregor's corpse in a room where it was now fully light. At that, the door to Samsa's bedroom opened, and Mr. Samsa appeared in his uniform, his wife on one arm, his daughter on the other. They all looked a little as if they had been crying. From time to time, Grete hid her face on her father's arm. Leave my house at once, said Mr. Samsa, and pointed to the door without disengaging himself from the woman. What do you mean by that? said the middle lodger, taken somewhat aback, with a feeble smile. The two others put their hands behind them and kept rubbing them together, as if in gleeful expectation of a fine set two in which they were bound to come off the winners. I mean just what I say answered Mr. Samsa, and advanced in a straight line with his two companions towards the lodger. He stood his ground, at first, quietly, looking at the floor as if his thoughts were taking a new pattern in his head. Then let us go by all means, he said, and looked up at Mr. Samsa, as if in a sudden access of humility he were expressing some renewed sanction for his decision. Mr. Samsa merely nodded briefly, once or twice, with meaning eyes. Upon that, the lodger really did go with long strides into the hall. His two friends had been listening and had quite stopped rubbing their hands for some moment and now went scuttling after him, as if afraid that Mr. Samsa might get into the hall before them and cut them off from their leader. In the hall, they all three took their hats off from the rack, their sticks from the umbrella stand, bowed in silence and quitted the apartment. With a suspiciousness which proved quite unfounded, Mr. Samsa and the two women followed them out to the landing. Leaning over the banisters, they watched the three figures slowly, but surely, going down the long stairs, vanishing from sight at a certain turn of the staircase on every floor and coming into view again after a moment or so. The more they dwindled, the more the Samsa family's interest in them dwindled. And when a butcher's boy met them and passed them on the stairs, coming up proudly with a tray on his head, Mr. Samsa and the two women soon left the landing and, as if a burden had been lifted from them, went back into their apartment.
They decided to spend this day in resting and going for a stroll. They had not only deserved such a respite from work, but absolutely needed it. And so, they sat down at the table and wrote three notes of excuses. Mr. Samsa to his board of management, Mrs. Samsa to her employer, and Grete to the head of her firm. While they were writing, the charwoman came in to say that she was going now, since her morning's work was finished. At first, they only nodded without looking up, but as she kept hovering there, they eyed her irritably. Well, said Mr. Samsa. The charwoman stood grinning in the doorway as if she had good news to impart to the family, but meant not to say a word unless properly questioned. The small ostrich feather, standing upright on her hat, which had annoyed Mr. Samsa ever since she was engaged, was waving gaily in all directions. Well, what is it then? asked Mrs. Samsa, who obtained more respect from the charwoman than the others. Oh, said the charwoman, giggling so amiably that she could not at once continue. Just this, you don't need to bother about how to get rid of the thing next door. It's been said to already. Miss Samsa and Grete bent over their letters again, as if preoccupied. Mr. Samsa, who perceived that she was eager to begin describing it all in detail, stopped her with a decisive hand. But since she was not allowed to tell her story, she remembered the great hurry she was in, being obviously deeply huffed. Bye, everybody, she said, whirling off violently, and departed with a frightful slamming of doors. She'll be given notice tonight, said Mr. Samsa, but neither from his wife nor from his daughter did he get any answer, for the charwoman seemed to have shattered again the composure they had barely achieved. They rose, went to the window, and stayed there, clasping each other tight. Mr. Samsa turned in his chair to look at them and quietly observed them for a little while. Then he called out, Come along now, do. Let bygones be bygones, and you might have some consideration for me. The two of them complied at once, hastened to him, caressed him, and quickly finished their letter. Then they all three left the apartment together, which was more than they had done for months, and went by tram into the open country outside the town. The tram, in which they were the only passengers, was filled with warm sunshine. Leaning comfortably back in their seats, they canvassed their prospects for the future. It appeared on closer inspection that these were not all that bad. For the jobs they had got, which so far they had never really discussed with each other, were all three admirable and likely to lead to better things later on. The greatest immediate improvement in their condition would, of course, arise from moving to another house. They wanted to take a smaller and cheaper, but also better situated and more easily run apartment than the one they had, which Gregor had selected. While they were thus conversing, it struck both Mr. and Mrs. Samsa almost at the same moment as they became aware of their daughter's increasing vivacity that in spite of all the sorrow of recent times which had made her cheeks pale, she had bloomed into a pretty girl with a good figure. They grew quieter and half unconsciously exchanged glances of complete agreement, having come to the conclusion that it would soon be time to find a good husband for her. And it was like a confirmation of their new dreams and excellent intentions that at the end of their journey, their daughter sprang to her feet first and stretched her young body. <laughs>